we can wait five minutes, then we will start, okay? Okay, yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Aspettiamo un attimo che si collegano, poi cominciamo. Sì, mi ha spiegato che oggi c'è lo sciopero e quindi magari molte persone non, non sono riuscite ad andare al lavoro dove hanno... No, non lo sapevo. Eh, forse neanche loro. Ne abbiamo parlato giusto lunedì e abbiamo detto di provare a farlo lo stesso. Ma, vabbè. Nel caso pochi ma buoni. Sì, sì, ma poi viene registrato in ogni caso. Yes. Sì, sì. Beh, fanno delle locandine bellissime. Infatti. Okay, good afternoon everyone. Um, 
I asked for five minutes. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. So. Yes, I can. Uh, thank you, Professor Beresi. Uh, I will, I will inform, introduce the Anna to the people. Then we can start. Muito boa tarde, colegas participantes desta palestra. Vamos dar início à palestra sobre o tema utilização de base de dados na pesquisa de genomas virais e SARS-CoV-2. A professora Ana Bernasconi, acho que é assim que se pronuncia, ela é pesquisadora Visadora de pós-doutoramento no Departamento de Eletrónica, Informação e Bioengenharia do Politécnico de Milano. Tem interesse nestas áreas de bioinformática, bases de dados e tem estado a trabalhar muito neste assunto que vai apresentar. Ela vai levar cerca de uma hora de tempo para fazer a sua apresentação, que eu acredito que deve ser de veras interessante pelo tema. Então, vamos manter os nossos micros desligados, de forma a não interferir na apresentação, até que nos seja dado tempo para questões. Podemos iniciar? Acredito que sim. Ana, por favor, você pode começar. Obrigado muito, Roxanne, por sua introdução, que eu tive o prazer de entender algumas palavras. Can you speak up? Uh, yes. Can you hear me better now? Yes, a bit better. Okay. So uh, I'm going to share my screen now. Let me know if you can see the slides. I can. Okay. Okay. Um, so thank you very much again for inviting me to this palestra. Um, my research is about uh, database, uh, uh, databases used for Anna, viral no, just, a, just a second. May I ask those who are not presenting to mute their mics? Doutor Gemo, doutor Gemo, pode pôr todos no silêncio, com exceção da apresentadora, por favor? Uh, professor, professor Kadir, I think you can mute him. I cannot. Let me try. Uh, I cannot because I'm not the host, but you can. Yes. Okay, okay, done. done. Thank, you. All, thank you. Yeah. Um, so, um, as I was saying, uh, my research is on databases uh, used uh, for viral genomes and in particular SARS-CoV-2. And I'm going to show you some research systems that have been built to store and uh, search viral genomes, understand their different parts, and then do some data analysis. Uh, as uh, I was already presented, uh, I am uh, going to uh, go very fast uh, on uh, my presentation. I am postdoctoral research at uh, Politecnico di Milano. Uh, mainly I work on bioinformatics, databases and data science methods applied to biological and genomic data. And uh, two and a half years ago, when unfortunately the COVID-19 pandemic started, uh, we were able to start working on viral genomics as we had a strong background on uh, human genomics. And uh, this was a very challenging period of which I will show the main results in this presentation. Um, very briefly, my education has a master in computer engineering from Politecnico di Milano and one from the University of Illinois in uh, Chicago, US. Then I worked as a business intelligence consultant uh, and uh, got my PhD again at Politecnico di Milano. Uh, very briefly, what you will find uh, in this talk uh, is uh, uh, of course, uh, um, considering the context uh, of the uh, COVID-19 outbreak, uh, which brought uh, uh, worldwide uh, attention towards the viral infection and the genetics aspects of the disease, you will find a short viral genomic primer because I am uh, supposing that uh, your um, 
background is mainly computer science instead of uh, biology and uh, virology, but I, I may be wrong. I, I have no data about this. Um, and then I will show you results of ongoing research efforts about modeling the genomic sequences and their related metadata, integrating them into big databases and search systems, and then performing data analysis that can provide insights on the evolution of the pandemic. Um, I will try to give a particular focus on emerging variants and their effects. Uh, then my talking long, just to give you an idea of the structure, after giving uh, this very crash course on viral bi biology, I will talk about the data sources that are available, the models that we built for the data, the databases that we were, were fed with integration pipelines, and then uh, um, a set of different tools that mainly interact with data and with knowledge information. And finally, uh, an interesting analysis on how amino acid changes trends uh, can suggest the birth of variants. So to give some perspective on the moments when we started uh, this research, uh, I'm showing this image uh, that to me is very clear in its purpose, meaning that uh, up to then, uh, up to 2020, uh, all the literature in, in the scientific world was uh, actually um, considering other viruses such as HIV mainly, uh, influenza, and something on SARS-CoV, this uh, red initial line, which uh, kind of exploded uh, in 2020 when SARS-CoV-2 appeared. So we have this huge peak that uh, probably now is even greater. Uh, consider that in 2020 there were already 28,000 uh, uh, publications concerning SARS-CoV-2 in, uh, in the public databases called PubMed. Uh, at the same time, what was happening uh, with uh, the, the collection and the position of uh, uh, viral sequences is what we can observe uh, uh, with this graph. We started at the beginning with, uh, of the pandemic, of course, with zero sequences, because uh, when we um, go through uh, the, the disease, uh, we may go to a lab, to a hospital, a lab, and they may uh, take uh, some bio samples from us just to analyze them. And in some cases, if the um, facilities, the money is available, they sequence this material. And this material and the information that is extracted from that, which we call sequence, is then uh, transferred to public databases. In the first year of the pandemic, until January 2021, we achieved uh, collecting uh, uh, one million sequences. While, uh, well, this image is a little bit old, but uh, as of today, we are at almost 12 million sequences. When I mean, uh, when I say we collected, I actually mean uh, uh, Gizaid, which is a public uh, database uh, that is available for all the research in the world to upload their sequences. Well, here we come with the uh, crash course on uh, RNA viruses. Um, as you may have heard, uh, SARS-CoV-2 is an RNA virus. Um, RNA is basically just one strand out of the double strand uh, DNA, that is uh, um, what is contained in our cells, for example. So RNA just has one strand. The nucleotide bases are the same except for timine, which is uh, substituted with uracil. And three by three, groups of three, uh, nucleotides form amino acids, which in turn form proteins that have several functions in the uh, organism. RNA viruses are actually very common. For example, the common cold, influenza, SARS, MERS, dengue, Ebola, a lot of viruses that we hear every day of are RNA viruses. But uh, how is the SARS-CoV-2 made uh, exactly? Uh, this is an image that shows that SARS-CoV-2 is a quite short uh, um, sequence, about uh, 30,000 uh, bases or nucleotides. Uh, if you consider that the human genome is about uh, billions of uh, 
uh, nucleotides, uh, then you understand that this is uh, an extremely simple organism. And uh, all the structural parts, so the shape of the virus is determined by these structural proteins, the spike, which confers the crown shape to the virus envelope, membrane and nucleocapsid, while other functions are, um, uh, are given by these uh, non-structural proteins, uh, which are divided into open reading frames. Um, what are we is interested in? Uh, when we look at uh, sequences of the SARS-CoV-2, mainly its mutations, because mutations, of course, uh, create differences from the natural behavior of the, of the initial organism. So we express mutations starting from the first sequence of SARS-CoV-2 that was uh, found and sequenced in Wuhan in China at the beginning of uh, 2020. And the way we express these mutations are by giving the position Around, uh, along the 30K sequence with the uh, nucleotide that was in the origin, uh, in the original uh, sequence and the, uh, instead the alternative uh, nucleotide that is found in the new sequence. Uh, more than nucleotide mutations, we're interested in amino acid changes. These are essentially uh, the translation from the nucleotide uh, system to the amino acid one. Remember that the amino acids are formed by three nucleotides. So for example, this is translated into a mutation on the amino acid uh, uh, sequence that is called spike D614G. Why are we interested in these changes? Because, uh, uh, well, they can give a change, they can produce an effect on a different behavior on the virus. They're important because uh, uh, there is actually a residue substitution. So the D is actually a molecule that is different from G. So having G instead of D could uh, provide different physical and chemical properties. Uh, what is important is also the position in the protein. For example, this specific change is close to the receptor, receptor binding domain, which is the part of the virus that attaches to the cells of the host organism. So in our case, to the human cells. And then we are also interested in the co-occurrence with other changes because sometimes changes can collaborate somehow uh, and uh, um, provoke uh, more serious uh, consequences. Well, um, how did we start? I'm going back to the uh, origin of this work for my research group. How did we start all this research? Uh, we didn't know much about virology. So at the beginning of 2020, we did a lot of, uh, we call it requirements engineering, a lot of interviews uh, and uh, um, groups, uh, of, uh, discussion groups uh, with experts to understand which kind of data was uh, relevant uh, in this domain. And uh, some of these uh, uh, words I have already mentioned them to you, sequences, mutations, we'll see what epitopes means, and to understand what the typical users uh, of virology, of uh, systems, uh, data systems uh, that are implemented in virology uh, are needing. So we talked to immunologists, uh, experts in genomic surveillance. So here you see a long list of people we talk to, including clinician, pathologist, uh, epidemiologist, because of course this is a viral disease that uh, touches a lot of different uh, sectors. And thanks to this, we were able to uh, develop a large number of systems of which I will give you an overview in this presentation. First of all, just to have a bird eye view of um, what we are going to see next, uh, we started from data sources. Uh, I mentioned before that GizAid is the one that uh, um, has the, uh, the greatest number of uh, sequence submissions, but there are also other systems, uh, mainly GeneBank, which is from NCBI in the US. Uh, CogUK was uh, uh, instead um, invented and designed for the United Kingdom. And this is another database which is uh, um, specific for parts of sequences called epitopes. So we import, we build pipelines that import all these data in our databases. And uh, we were driven in this by some conceptual models. 
we were able to uh, to build a lot of different systems with different purposes. So, a brief overview of data sources. Uh, first thing we did was to uh, make a, a state-of-the-art research. We understood all the different systems that were available for virologists, for any researcher that wants to um, understand aspects of viruses. Uh, I'm going to focus on this part because it's the, uh, the sources of data. These are major database institutions, uh, mainly um, this is a consortia made by a Japan institution, a European one and a United States um, institution that have a shared, um, uh, a shared organization of uh, databases. Then we instead have some other from China, mainly the China National Gene Bank. And then we have this uh, GIZAID, which is uh, the most important one in the area of influenza, of uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2, and now, uh, unfortunately, also for monkeypox. Um, so this was the world where we had to uh, intervene and enter for our research. We used as a driving uh, uh, force our uh, uh, viral conceptual model. This is a very simple uh, entity relationship diagram that we devised uh, in the first uh, months of the pandemic uh, as soon as the first data was available, so we were able to understand which were the typical metadata. Uh, you can see that the uh, central entity is a sequence that is described by several uh, uh, information about, uh, for example, its completeness, uh, the length, uh, the percentage of some nucleotides uh, uh, G and C typically, or unknown nucleotides, some classification. And then it is described by four different uh, uh, perspectives. We have the biological perspective, which uh, has to do with the virus uh, from which the sequence was derived, and the host sample, which was uh, extracted from the host, uh, so it has information about the collection date, the geography uh, of so which continent, country, region, um, lab actually extracted the material. We have information instead of the organization of the sequencing because usually for um, for preparing a sequence we need to have a sequencing project with funding, with facilities. Then we have the experiment type, which because for the for extracting the sequence you need a sequencing technology, uh, assembly methods, coverage. There are some parameters that also inform on the quality of the process. And then the most important part is uh, uh, in the right upper corner. Uh, I called it analytical group because actually it contains information about uh, the mutations of the sequence. So um, it is made um, a comparison between that sequence and the reference of that virus. When it's compared, we can spot the mutations, so the letters in the positions that are different from the reference one. We have the nucleotide mutations and we have also the amino acid mutations. Amino acid mutations always refer to an annotation, meaning the annotation could be a gene or a protein, so a specific part of the um, of the sequence uh, to which the mutation uh, belongs. Then we have also possible impacts that can be inferred using some tools. Uh, to this information, specifically to the uh, mutations, we were interested in uh, uh, connecting some uh, impacts. So mutations can actually, as I was mentioning before, could actually impact the protein stability of the, of the virus protein. The epidemiology aspect, so the virus with a mutation may become more transmissible, more infectious, um, giving a more se severe disease or uh, giving a, a disease that uh, uh, leads to a higher fatality rate, for example. Actually, you may wonder if uh, viral transmission and infectivity are the same thing. They are not, because the viral transmission is typically the uh, ability of the virus to 
pass from one host, host to the other, while infectivity is the ability of the virus to establish the infection in one host. Because it could happen that the virus uh, um, is in the proximity of the host but is unable to establish an infection. And then we also have the immunology impacts or effects that, that are connected, for example, to the sensitivity of the virus to treatments with the uh, serum of convalescent uh, uh, patients. So people who already contracted uh, COVID-19 but uh, have uh, somehow uh, developed their uh, own antibodies and uh, uh, can resist uh, to the disease or the sensitivity to monoclonal antibodies uh, neutralizing, uh, which uh, were used in many cases for curing the disease, or the ability to bind to the cell of the host receptor. We have a small picture here that shows how actually the, uh, the spike protein is able to attach the, this ACE2, which is an enzyme of our cells that unfortunately is recognized by the virus. Well, um, up to now I've spoken about mutations, which are single positions that are changed. But at some point, uh, the virus started organizing in uh, what we call variants. So basically um, a set of co-occurring mutations that happen all together on uh, a sequence. And uh, if we consider these uh, quite big sets of mutations that co-occur on sequences, we start to uh, see what, we, what are called variants. The World Health Organization um, decided to give uh, um, easy to remember uh, names, which are uh, alpha, beta, gamma, delta, up to omicron. And uh, yesterday I heard of uh, centauri also, which I'm not sure uh, comes from the Greek alphabet, but uh, uh, it's quite interesting because uh, uh, this uh, need for giving new names started when actually the virus uh, um, started organizing in this way. So here you can see that, uh, uh, for example, the alpha variant has uh, about uh, 20 um, common and typical changes uh, that are defined using the name of the protein. For example, the one that we saw before is spike D614G. Um, here I collected a couple of uh, images of variants where I, uh, I show all the amino acid changes and the connected effects. So for example, there is a, a literature uh, production that speaks about uh, this particular uh, uh, amino acid change producing uh, a virus which is more infectious. This uh, also holds for another uh, change with higher transmission. Sometimes these effects uh, are linked to group of effects or to the whole variant, which means that the uh, presence, the co-occurrence co of all these uh, changes leads to a variant that is uh, uh, leading to uh, higher disease severity or higher transmission. And for this we started to collect uh, uh, all the um, literature uh, information, uh, references, uh, papers, uh, a lot of preprints, but uh, nowadays we also have a lot of uh, peer-reviewed uh, information uh, to actually prove uh, these uh, effects. The same here applies to the Delta variant, which has some, uh, some effects connected to single changes, to groups, or to the whole variant with their references. Well, since we are talking about uh, variants, uh, effects, uh, uh, sets of changes that characterize variants, I, um, I would like also to mention, even if the, the, the table is uh, hardly readable here, that uh, when we looked at all the variants of concern that were defined uh, according to the WHO, the World Health Organization, we noticed that there were a lot of different problems uh, in the agreement of these, uh, um, of these different definitions. For example, the alpha variant 
if we took uh, uh, five different four different uh, data sources uh, we read that was uh, in one was characterized by just three changes in another one by about uh, 12 and then even more uh, in, in other uh, um, in other data sources so by actually um, recognizes the, this data chaos this data quality issues we felt the need to produce a very simple schema um, it may not appear simple here, but um, I can assure you that uh, we really try to simplify all the possible concepts that are in this domain uh, that explains uh, all the differences and uh, concepts that are needed to study SARS-CoV-2. Um, we call this model COV-2K. Uh, on the left, we have what we uh, usually called knowledge representation and on the right we have the data representation. Why? Because uh, the data is basically sequences that are collected uh, from, data, um, from databases uh, that are the ones uh, deposited by laboratories, while the knowledge is simply how we decide to name variants, which effects we assign to them, which properties are known about specific uh, positions of the virus that are more, um, more interesting or more critical than others, which structure some parts of the virus have, and which uh, um, structure the molecule of amino acids have. So with this... Uh, uh, representation we were able to then guide uh, uh, a very broad uh, data integration process and uh, just to focus on the problem that we were uh, mentioning before about variants you see that here we have an entity um, that represents a variant the variant can be named in different way so the naming according to different organizations may be different so I may have the alpha variant but I can call it as well B117 according to pangolin nomenclature for example or according to the Public Health England it was uh, something like um, uh, VOC so variant of concern 2020 December uh, and then we have the context the context defines the sets of mutations that are relevant, that are characterizing that variation. Then uh, effects are of, of three types, as we saw it before. Uh, they may be connected to the whole variant, so to the whole set of uh, um, changes that uh, characterize that variant, just to one change or to a group of changes. Mm, this is a very uh, brief detour to uh, with respect to what was uh, what i was saying just to show you that uh, this uh, database is uh, easily linkable at least uh, at the modeling level uh, to a database uh, that is uh, observing the clinical aspects of the disease because uh, here in the yellow part you see a very simplified uh, uh, version of the model that I showed before. We have the virus sequence with the changes, the effects, and of course in cases where um, the patient uh, that was hospitalized and from whom the, the, the virus sequence was extracted in case the data is collected also about uh, him or her, we can actually um, produce a much uh, richer representation of the situation because then the patient is attached to uh, symptoms at the admission, comorb comorbidity, risk factors to the hospital that uh, uh, has a patient, but also to the encounters, the hospitalization course, uh, the symptoms during the different encounters while the patient uh, is uh, under observation. And then uh, this is actually uh, even uh, more difficult to obtain is the, inf the genetic information about the, ho the, about the host, which is a patient. 
And this was a very big project uh, to which we collaborated. Uh, mainly the project was uh, uh, devoted to uh, collecting genetic information and clinical information about patients. And now we are, we are starting a different project with an, uh, an hospital in Milan, Italy, Ospedale Sacco, where we are doing a small analysis on patients for whom we have both the clinical information and the sequence of the virus uh, that was uh, uh, collected. Unfortunately, for doing this kind of research, uh, it is uh, um, kind of difficult to obtain uh, all the data that, are that have this uh, patient virus sequence link because typically they are data are collected by different teams, different uh, labs or hospitals. And unfortunately, this connection is uh, hard to maintain or is maintained, but then is not made public in the database that we have access to. So uh, based on the models that I showed, um, we then built uh, databases. Uh, so very briefly, this is uh, uh, the pipeline that uh, took the data from the sources. Then we, we also collected some other species, not only SARS-CoV-2, but also similar viruses. We constructed uh, the content, the metadata content. We curated the sequences by attaching other metadata. And then there was a whole work of content optimization to be able then to offer a search interface uh, that I will show next. And uh, this data actually uh, should be updated, but we were able to store 7 million sequences from the Gizade source and about uh, 3.5 million for the other sources. Uh, this is a pipeline that puts together both data, which is what I just showed, and the part on knowledge uh, derived from the schema that we saw before, COV2K. Uh, we are ab able to extract uh, variants, effect, position of interest, and so on and so forth from very authoritative uh, sources and also from uh, literature. Uh, we're harmonizing this information by doing uh, entity reconciliation, uh, duplicate removal, uh, cleaning in general of the uh, notation and the homogenization of the notation for mutations. And we offer all this content through a RESTful API. Um, for what regards data tools, the first one that we produce is simply a um, uh, an interface that allows you to search all the sequences that you wish by selecting uh, some metadata which are extracted from this um, conceptual model and by building in this red part by building patterns of mutations both with conjunctive and disjunctive queries so you may be able to ask for all the sequences that have this mutation at the nucleotide level and these two other mutations at the amino acid level, maybe on the spike protein or on the uh, nucleocapsid protein. As a consequence, you obtain a, a table of sequences that match the results. Um, we also considered other concepts such as epitopes, which are strings of amino acids from the virus that can be recognized by antibodies or our BT cell receptors to provoke an immune response. So imagine that uh, this is a virus, the uh, purple one. Um, the yellow parts are these uh, small stretches of its sequence that can be recognized by our antibodies, which are the light blue uh, symbols. So um, we actually looked at the immune epitope database, which is the largest open source uh, collection of epitopes. Um, we actually tried to understand if the um, well-known vaccines, Pfizer and Moderna, were using one or, other, one or the other epitopes. And what we understood is that they're using all the available epitopes on the spike protein in their design. And uh, what is more uh, of... Um, uh, great concern for epitope design is that uh, if the virus uh, if the virus changes so if it mutates then our antibodies uh, or our antibodies instructed by vaccines may not be able anymore to recognize it so 
This is the reason why we built EpiSurf, which is a system that puts together virus surf, so whatever we built before for finding population of sequences, and epitopes. What epitope, uh, EpiSurf allows you to do is shown in this image. Basically, um, for example, here I, um, I extracted uh, all the um, mutations of the Delta variant in the United Kingdom. And at the time, uh, we had uh, 1,050, uh, sorry, 150,000 sequences. With these uh, black columns, uh, we count how many sequences out of these uh, 150,000 had a mutation in that specific location. So our x-axis is the whole spike protein, which has 1,200 position. This epitope, which was very used in the, uh, in the vaccines that were used, uh, actually appeared to be in the same area where two mostly present mutations uh, were happening in the Delta variant. So this is a tool that allows you to study which epitopes could be impacted or put at risk, let's say, by mutations. Then the story is much more complex because there is a difference between T cell and B cell uh, epitopes. So we're not immunologists, but this was uh, a tool that immunologists uh, believed as useful to guide, further guide uh, their uh, research. And then I would like to show you virus bits, uh, which uh, also uses this uh, visual uh, um, representation to show the emergence of variants. First of all, I think this is uh, the, the most uh, um, interesting and self-explanatory slide because uh, we started uh, this tool uh, when we had very few sequences. And this was a summer of uh, 2020. Uh, we analyzed only 160 Italian sequences and we made different tracks uh, based on groups, temporal groups. So you have before, mid-summer and after summer. This is the whole virus and you can see how Italian people had been um, infected before summer by viruses uh, with this uh, mutational profile. Then during summer, there was something slightly different. You can see one here, one added here, uh, maybe this increased, but not so much in general. After summer, when people came back from traveling, vacations, whatsoever, uh, actually you see that uh, there was a much more various uh, uh, profile of mutations. The same thing happened uh, in Spain, basically, uh, or thanks to uh, the virus that was uh, in Spain. Uh, here we see that uh, Spain uh, during summer and Spain after summer, there was a particular mutation in the spike protein, uh, which uh, uh, was already present with a 46% of uh, uh, this uh, uh, sample of Spanish um, uh, of Spanish sequences. After summer, of course, it increased, uh, but uh, it was already present. While in Italy, it was zero before summer, during summer, um, while it became 39% of, uh, uh, of the sequences after summer. So this is still uh, with very small numbers because at the time uh, um, in Europe we didn't have so many sequences, but it, it's already, it was already very informative of the dynamics that the virus was uh, following. I have a uh, um, couple more of these examples uh, that I, I may uh, go uh, very quickly with. Uh, this was the um, famous case of uh, minks in uh, Denmark. Uh, it appears that uh, humans infected minks and then uh, the infection went back to humans. Uh, this was uh, just uh, an hypothesis that we had uh, and uh, uh, of course it should have been tested much more thoroughly. But uh, you can see how uh, humans before uh, this, uh, so, uh, just to recap maybe, um, 
you I don't know how much aware uh, were you about this uh, news from Denmark. Um, in, uh, in Denmark, there was a spillover uh, in the COVID-19 uh, for, for minks. And uh, basically, uh, the um, uh, government decided to kill all, all uh, these uh, million, several millions of minks uh, because they were afraid that the um, mutation could go back uh, to humans and make the virus more, uh, uh, more serious uh, somehow. Um, so we spotted a case where a mutation that was present uh, in, in a very low uh, percentage in humans, whereas it was present uh, much more in, uh, in, uh, in quantity, in, uh, um, in visons, in, so in, in minks, then after the, um, the spillover in Denmark, it actually grew, grew also for humans. So this may suggest, but it's absolutely not a, a um, conclusion that, that can be made uh, as a scientific uh, output. It may uh, suggest that actually the um, virus was mutating in the, uh, in the minks and it could have spread in uh, humans with these new mutations. We don't know if they were more, uh, um, if they would lead to a more severe disease, but it's an interesting point anyhow. Um, and here we have some slides that show that we were able to spot the growth of the alpha variant. So we, you see that um, I made these tracks for uh, uh, 15 days each. So this was the second half of October, first half of November, second half of November, first half of December. And uh, you can see in these uh, uh, lines that have been highlighted that there is a clear um, increase in the percentage of these uh, specific spots, which are indeed the specific amino acid changes that characterize the alpha variant. This was quite interesting because we were able to spot it like two days before the news was spread everywhere in the newspapers worldwide. So we were quite, even if it, it, it was not uh, useful uh, to, uh, for a publication, for uh, informing uh, authorities, we were quite happy of our tool because we were able to, uh, to test it on a... Um, on a real case. Same thing with the beta uh, variant, uh, formerly called the South African variant, and uh, with the epsilon variant, uh, which formerly called uh, the variant from California, where you can see uh, clearly from a 12% to a 61%. Uh, what is interesting is also that this variant was actually communicated to the community in, uh, uh, at the beginning of February, where you could actually see this trend already in uh, December, January. Um, and finally, as a final uh, tool, I would like you to see the potential of Viruclast. Viruclast is uh, our last tool which allows uh, to make comparisons between different groups of sequences. And you can create groups based on different lineages, different periods of time, different periods of space, or a combination of the above. So it allows to generate testable hypotheses and to uh, see, validate if they make sense using the uh, real data. So I show them, I, I show the potential of viral cluster using uh, 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 an example. Uh, actually, this is the early evolution of the Delta variant. Um, the first uh, question that we asked ourselves was if there were uh, mutations that were not observed in India, which was a likely place of origin of this variant, but were instead observed in the rest of Asia. So to understand this, we produced a spatial analysis. Uh, you can see here two curves. They are histograms of uh, um, sequences that were collected first in uh, India and then in, uh, outside of India. So they are delta, of course, before it was in India and short after outside of India. 
namely in the whole Asia continent. Um, the spatial analysis actually showed that uh, there were five mutations uh, that uh, were much more present in Asia with respect to India. So uh, target is India, as you see we have 30, 25, even here 73, but the counterpart, the background, which is Asia, was having much higher percentages. So we went on by analyzing these uh, five uh, uh, mutations and we performed a temporal analysis, this time by uh, making a comparison between three months, May, June and July 2021. We produced uh, these two um, um, maps, hot maps, um, where you see that, for example, um, in particular, these three mutations, uh, while were mm, very low uh, in uh, India, were instead uh, fixed, this is a uh, virology typical term, fixed um, in Asia. So they became basically the normal uh, in, uh, in the rest of Asia. And this also happened for the spike D950N um, mutation. So this was interesting because uh, we asked ourselves if these novel mutations uh, were selected because they confer some advantages to Delta, then they should not be observed in other closely related variants. For example, Kappa. Kappa was born more or less at the same time as Delta in India, and but it quickly disappeared. We didn't hear much of, the, uh, of Kappa as we did with Delta. Um, so we, we made this hypothesis that by um, comparing Delta and Kappa, we should have seen um, these four or five mutations just in Delta. And this was uh, what we proved with the custom analysis. The tool allows you to do this. And actually Delta showed that these uh, uh, 156, uh, 7, 8, and 950 mutation were only present in Delta, but not in Kappa, which suggested that the acquisition of these novel mutations could have epidemiological implications. And indeed, this, was, uh, this is what happened uh, with the Delta variant, as we know. Finally, we have a couple of knowledge tools very briefly, because we already saw this, uh, um, this model, we built an API to navigate this, uh, this model, all the relationships, and now you are allowed to express in this API questions such as what are the characteristics of the residue changes of the alpha variant, so meaning chemical molecule characteristics, what amino acid changes of uh, a variant named in, in one of the many ways fall within the receptor binding domain, which is a specific region, or which are the effects of the variants that include a, a specific change. Um, since we understood that it was very difficult to massively fill uh, our database with the variants and mutation effects, we devised a method that is, uses, uh, is using deep learning uh, to extract from abstract of research information of this kind. For example, the, uh, the tool is uh, able to extract from this phrase, increased case fatality rate correlating strongly with the proportion of virus bearing G614, a uh, more structured information such as spike D614G, higher fatality rate. Or, for example, from this list, it is uh, uh, able to extract uh, for each uh, of the mutations uh, information such as mutation leading to lower sensitivity to neutralizing monoclonal antibodies. We built a tool around this that is helping uh, researchers uh, to actually accumulate more knowledge of this kind. Uh, so the expert actually performs a keyword-based search uh, on a very big uh, data set, uh, CORE-19 data, data set that is collecting all the literature about COVID-19. Uh, we may, for example, we ask for papers regarding this mutation A222V, 
and we have a paper list with this uh, mutation highlighted. For each of these abstracts, then uh, there is a prediction model based on uh, a transformer-based GPT-2 uh, prediction model that is able to um, infer uh, the, these triplets, the mutation, the effect, and the level. Of course, sometimes uh, it, it makes errors, actually many times, so we are actually working into improving it. Uh, but we are using, a, um, uh, in my opinion, a very nice explainable AI mechanism that tries to, with these saliency maps, so it tries to highlight uh, with color the parts of the abstract that were used by the model to infer the prediction in order to help someone support the user to understand what is uh, uh, wrong and what is not. This is a tool for expert users, of course. Uh, and finally, and then I conclude my talk, I hope in time, uh, I would like you to show uh, the convolution analysis. The convolution analysis focused on the co-occurrence of amino acid changes. So what we have so far called variant. The intuition of this analysis is that a variant can be identified possibly in an early stage, by observing the time series dynamics of their amino acid changes. Different changes could indicate the birth of a variant if the time series are similar. When I speak about time series, I mean uh, the uh, prevalences uh, that, uh, that are uh, uh, retrieved week, week by week in a specific geolocation, and are not only similar, but also growing, because if they are decreasing, then we are not very interested. Okay, they are all growing a little, as little soldiers. Uh, why, why do I use uh, this metaphor? Because you remember the images I showed about uh, um, uh, virus bits, uh, where we had these black columns that were increasing their heights, showing that the prevalence is actually increasing. Outcomes. What we aim to prove is that the emergence of variants can be traced through purely data-driven methods. So we used no biological assumption, no phylogenetics method. An early warning system could rely exclusively on the positive sequences. Let me show how. Okay, suppose that uh, this is uh, the data from UK that we collected from uh, May 2020 up to March 2021. All these lines represent uh, the trend, uh, increasing, decreasing, moving trend of uh, single mutations in that location. So for example, this uh, line, this red line is showing that the uh, mutation R203K in the N protein in UK during these specific weeks was going from a 60% of all the sequences that were collected up to 19%, then down to 20%, and so on and so forth. What we were interested in is in spotting these kind of behaviors. Can you see here in the, in the black uh, rectangle that I put here? There is a, a um, let's say, four, five, maybe ten, because uh, we don't see what is uh, uh, behind, um, about ten uh, trends of amino acid changes that are going up together. And this turned out to be the UK variant, because as you can see in the future, then the UK variant had uh, an exponential growth and got basically to 100, to, to cover 100 of the viruses in the whole country. So our uh, goal was to spot this kind of situation. How did we do it? We prepared data in this way. We first made uh, um, tables for each change uh, in a specific country and specific week, we collected the percentage, so how many sequences had that change out of the total collected in the week. Then we aggregated this count 
uh, having basically the story of each of these uh, mutations. So this line uh, says that uh, in, in the um, week one of December there were 1012 sequences out of uh, this total. Then we also collected our ground truth, uh, which is uh, which are the uh, characterizing amino acid changes of each of these variants. This is a typical notation of variants where you can recognize alpha, beta, and epsilon, for example. Um, and then we developed a data analysis method that basically um, performed uh, clustering of all these time series. Um, we use the k medoids clustering and then we chose uh, the optimal value of uh, cluster numbers uh, using the ones that maximize the average silhouette score. And this produced, for, for example, for UK, a lot of different uh, um, graphs, one for each week, where you can see that there are different colors that represent the different um, recognized clusters. Here I already spotted the one that to me showed the first time where the alpha variant was observed. Uh, then what we did is we asked ourselves which of these clusters could signal the emergence of a new virus variant. And for this we spotted only those clusters with an increasing trend in their prevalence. Then we wanted only the first moment, the first week, where uh, this cluster was spotted. So we actually checked uh, between different weeks uh, the, simil the similarities uh, between uh, the found clusters. Uh, and therefore, from all these uh, windows, we were able to select only these uh, as the first moment where an interesting cluster is spotted. And again, you see that the 8th of December is maintained. Finally, we assigned a posteriori, this was more like a validation of our method, we assigned a posteriori um, all these trends to known lineages, trying to identify the clusters for which there is a close compositional match to a known lineage. So again, the one, the clusters found in the 8th of December of 2020 Show, were shown to be very similar to the B117 UK. Of course, it was also similar slightly to other variants because variants have mutations in, uh, in common, but the highest result, well, the best result was reached with the UK. Thanks to this method, we were able to study uh, some aspects. For example, the birth and development of uh, the alpha variant in uh, European countries. Uh, here you see that uh, we started in the first week of December with the UK, where it arrived about one month later in Italy and Netherlands, while uh, in other um, states it arrived even um, uh, later in January. Then we did the same thing with uh, uh, US uh, states. Um, here you see a slightly different uh, graph, but basically the size of these uh, uh, circles is given by the uh, similarity of uh, the spotted clusters to the variant that you see in the title of each graph. And what was interesting is that uh, we um, found uh, three different groups uh, that have different behaviors. So mainly the, the US states uh, in the west part of the country uh, first had a very uh, US uh, typical uh, variant, then had the epsilon, which is a California one, and then had the alpha one. In the center, instead, we had uh, US and alpha, and uh, in the uh, upper uh, um, uh, north, uh, uh, east side of the uh, US, we had the uh, US, uh, this uh, US2 variant, then the IOTA, which, is, uh, which was also called the New York uh, variant, and then again the Alpha, which at the end uh, uh, won uh, over all until the Delta arrived. And finally, to validate uh, uh, our method, we were able to show that uh, the, the point where we would have uh, uh, sent our early warning, so in the where you see the first uh, 
big circle uh, was compared to the uh, moment uh, indicated by the dash line. The dash line was the first communication of that variant to the whole world, made from a government, a research group or a ministry of the health. Uh, we were able to spot uh, several weeks earlier many of these uh, uh, variants such as alpha, beta, epsilon, zeta and kappa uh, for delta and iota about at the same time whereas for the gamma in Brazil uh, we, our uh, warning would have come only two weeks later this of course may also be due to lack of data um, as well as the same holds for many other variants of which uh, unfortunately we do not know, we do not have data a uh, very brief summary of my talk, I show, I hope I were able to uh, show how this data-driven approach uh, can be successful for analyzing the SARS-CoV-2 virus and maybe either viruses when the data can be collected for gaining insights on their evolution. The objectives of the research were developing, developing methods and tools dedicated to generic users, so no uh, strong biological uh, background needed uh, and also using them for our own analysis of which I showed some examples. Ongoing work on our side are a curated knowledge graph for SARS-CoV-2 and the interactions with the host, an early warning system for variants uh, of which uh, the, the last slides were just a hint and uh, the prediction of lineage evolution based on established co-occurring pairs of mutation. As very high level goals, uh, we would like to make the pandemic uh, explainable by exposing viral data and knowledge and define, resolve computational challenges in viral genomics, uh, taking advantage of data science methods. And here I can conclude. I also want to thank uh, all the people, senior uh, colleagues that have collaborated to these works uh, and junior colleagues uh, that have collaborated and implemented these works. And thank you again for your attention, and I'm here if you have any curiosity. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Really, really interesting. Uh, uh, I couldn't imagine that uh, databases can be so used in uh, such uh, fields like uh, medicine, health, the virus, etc. So it's really interesting. I think we missed that here in Mozambique because our IT courses are for general applications only uh, at the graduation level, okay? Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm sure uh, the participants also liked it and uh, I can see there is a hand someone wants to ask something uh, after that i will also do one small question so i will ask irish to ask irish please okay thank you Roxanne. thank you very much Roxanne. thank you anna for your beautiful presentation it was very interesting to see the development of this virus uh, my background is on molecular biology, genetic and, uh, and uh, plant biotechnology. Uh, but I was interested in the models that you showed because they are quite similar also to plants and the databases that you use are quite similar. My question is if uh, there is a, any way or if you already done it in your studies, a prediction or a um, uh, or, uh, how can I say, a uh, connection, a correlation between the, if, uh, the region where the virus is from and the mutations that are more frequent? That will be my first question. My second question is that, is that if you can um, associate the mutations also with the treatment that most of the patients uh, has undertaken. I don't know if you already studied this, and this will be my my two questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Iris. Uh, very very interesting questions. And uh, as I said at the beginning, I I had no 
uh, information on uh, on your backgrounds. So I hope I didn't uh, uh, bore uh, the, the molecular biologists too much with the uh, with the vi uh, with the gen genomics primer. Um, so I, I will start with the second question. Actually, uh, this would would be super interesting. However. Uh, it is still very difficult uh, to produce uh, research uh, that connects uh, the genomics of the virus with the clinical information on the patients uh, because this information uh, is not available in public databases and it is also very hard to extract, uh, to, to obtain from uh, a single uh, or private research groups. We have this small collaboration with an hospital uh, in our city and they were able to provide, uh, for example, uh, 3,000 uh, uh, clinical records of uh, COVID-19 patients, which is a good number, um, and let's say 800 sequences of the virus. But once we did the intersection between these two datasets, we were left with about 100 uh, uh, patients. So it is very difficult to make statistically um, uh, significant uh, research when you have 100 uh, uh, patients uh, possibly spread along a two years span with different mutations. Uh, therefore, uh, what you are suggesting at the moment uh, is still uh, very, very hard to do. Uh, it would be for sure possible in terms of uh, techniques and methods that are uh, needed. Uh, we're thinking also if uh, at some point we were uh, thinking about uh, looking at um, other uh, diseases, other viruses, for example, HIV databases are quite uh, rich uh, in terms of clinical information. But unfortunately, uh, the sequences of the virus are instead very badly curated. In some cases, they were obtained with very old uh, uh, sequencing machines, so the quality of the, of the sequences is not uh, enough uh, for uh, having uh, information that is trustable. So on this side, unfortunately, I don't have many good results to share. Um, for the first question, instead, if I am not mistaken, you asked if uh, we did some uh, um, study on the relation between regions where uh, uh, regions and mutations and uh, where they actually were, were born, were, uh, were developed. Am I correct or I, did I understood? Uh, okay. Uh, so, in, in, also. so, sorry Iris, I didn't hear. Yes, you understood it well and more frequent also to see whether we are uh, where we are going with the mutations if it's more uh, something of a specific region it we can correlate it or not yes yes okay um this is also very interesting it also requires a uh, big numbers uh, we have an ongoing project that uh, unfortunately i was not able to show today but uh, um, i can give you the link if you are curious uh, it's called variant hunter um, variant hunter allows you to look for uh, uh, variants that are uh, changing basically so let's suppose that we are look at uh, the ba2 variant which is the omicron 2 and we're interested to see if uh, a specific change or a specific group of changes is increasing or even decreasing with a different rate as the normal variant uh, this allows you to spot possibly emerging, possibly new variants. Indeed, we are trying to propose it as a uh, tool to propose new variants, new lineages of the phylogenetic tree. And uh, this can be also used uh, by selecting different regions. So, of course, the granularity that we have is the usual one. We have the continent, uh, country and regions. 
Um, with regions you have to be careful because I speak about Italy for example uh, in, in our region which is the one where Milano is uh, and is also one of the biggest regions in Italy um, sometimes the tool is not able to provide any information because uh, the sequences that are collected every week are not enough to achieve statistical significance. We look at trends of four weeks. Out in this trend, actually, I maybe I could actually um, show it if we have uh, time. I don't know. I, I ask uh, Roxanne and Luciano. Uh, you, can, you can answer the questions, no problem. OK. Uh, so, for example, um, uh, this is another tool that we are uh, currently uh, developing and uh, you may choose, uh, we don't have data of the very last weeks, but uh, if I look at uh, Italy and I want to see the uh, mutations that are the most trending, I have this slope, which is a very coarse, uh, um, coarse way of uh, uh, seeing the, the trend, uh, the, the uh, increasing and decreasing trend. You can see that it's going from 17, 26, 40, 59 percent. You can also see it with a heat map. So there is actually a trend of, uh, of mutations that are increasing, uh, which are these. And then you may ask yourself, uh, uh, is this um, uh, BA5, for example, uh, which is uh, a very uh, well-known uh, uh, case in, in Europe in the, in the last, uh, sorry, select from lineages. So I may ask if uh, um, to see only the mutations that are in BA5 in this case. And indeed, uh, it cleaned all the ones that uh, are not in BA5. Uh, one other thing I can do is uh, lineage specific. So I may suppose that in Italy, in this period, uh, BA2, uh, uh, for example, ha had uh, somehow uh, mutations that were uh, doing a different uh, trend. And this may be understood by looking at this table because it says uh, that uh, the yellow one are the typical, the mutation that are typical of this uh, um, BA2, but the white one are not. So it could be interesting to see, to, to analyze uh, what this uh, specific change uh, is doing. Why is it increasing with a different speed uh, that, than the other changes, for example? And this could be then um, broken down into smaller locations. So in case I'm interested in what happens only in one region, I use a, a finer granularity and I study, for example, Lombardy. I'm sorry that I, I'm not showing something on Mozambique because uh, uh, I am afraid that uh, um, the, the data is not uh, available but uh, maybe we can try, uh, I haven't uh, so far tried. Uh, Mozambique, let's do it for lineage independent, so it will need less data. Um, yeah, what I was expecting, but maybe we can see if in the past uh, more data was collected, quite unlikely, uh, unfo no, okay, it was just a, a um, wh whenever you try things uh, online uh, that they are not uh, uh, successful, but you can see the potential of this tool in analyzing uh, uh, what happens in different regions. What you suggested Iris is a uh, one step further, being able from uh, uh, the analysis to go back uh, to the to the specific regions. Uh, this we haven't addressed that yet, but uh, I find it a very interesting uh, 
uh, suggestion, so yeah, I, I will take it uh, further. Thank you. Uh, Irish, are you happy you have more questions? Thank you for the space. In fact, I have one more question, maybe not direct to Anna, but uh, to the uh, people, colleagues, I don't know, organizing this uh, presentation. I am from uh, the uh, Faculty of Science, the Biological Science Department. And uh, we will be very interested in have more um, presentations like this, but uh, more in depth with the algorithm, the, the bioinformatic analysis itself behind it, because today Anna presented a bit more of the results of it. So maybe if we can digest it a little bit and uh, give a small presentation of that, I would be very interested and also my students. So are you planning to do something more in that uh, subject or not? Thank you very much. This was the last question. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Irish. Professor Varesi, can you help us? Uh, yes. Uh, well, I think, well, I'm not sure. I don't know, actually. I don't know if Anna is able to do that and uh, she is willing to do that. Or we can ask for her help uh to let's say identify uh the right persons and maybe uh plan for i don't know one or two presentations uh after our summer so let's say uh september or october uh could be a nice time frame because now well i'm gonna uh, come to uh maputo in 10 days from now so a bit more than a week uh and then we have august which is usually uh, our summer break and so uh, I think we cannot plan uh, you know additional um, talks besides the one next week let's say before uh, our summer break but we can work uh, on this kind of presentations for September or October so we need to ask Anna and we need her help uh, yeah, I, confirm. I confirm that I can help maybe not myself, but in, in our group, for sure, we can come up with some, uh, some presentation. Maybe we can even talk to you before to understand what is of more interest. More interest yeah, if you, group. Uh, if you, I'm saying uh, Iris, Iris uh, can send us or send, send me uh, a couple of lines to uh, better understand what you, let's say, would like to know. Uh, we can understand uh, if and how we can help you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Irish, you can use even Dr. Juvencio from uh, your faculty, or you can do go directly to Dr. Paresi or to me, and uh, we can arrange something from after summer. And on these topics, you are interested, okay? Okay, thank you very much. Can we exchange through the chat to the email, please? Thank you very much. Our pleasure. Uh, now we have any other questions from... Dr. Sergio, Leila? Any other question? Things like no. Oh, let, let, let me ask you the, the, the very final question. Given all the numbers, given all the numbers and all the data you have, can you tell us uh, by when uh, the COVID-2 is going to be over? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we wish, we wish. Uh, it's all very, it's impressively difficult uh, to uh, extract uh, tangible and uh, actionable information from here. Um, also, as, uh, as, as I, you may have understood and Professor Baresi know, um, 
we are all computer scientists, we uh, interacted a lot with the domain experts, uh, but mainly we provided all the computational and uh, expertise and the, um, the knowledge to build the systems. The idea is then that expert users use the system to inform their own uh, interpretation of the situation and uh, inform possibly decisions. So it's not really in my hands and my possibilities <laughs> to make predictions, uh, but uh, I really hope that uh, this was uh, an interesting presentation and that I really hope for, uh, for us that we keep producing uh, interesting insights. You know, I wanted to try, but I, 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 I knew the answer. <laughs> of course. Anna, I have one question, very innocent one, but uh, the studies can be used to develop any other vaccine or something like that? But any other? You mean uh, in the in the SARS-CoV-2 uh, context or for other viruses? Yes. Oh, okay. Yes. Yeah, uh, yes. Okay. Um, okay. So I I mentioned the vaccine uh, world concept uh, when I spoke about um, our system EpiSurf. EpiSurf is a computational tool that allows, uh, in a very quick and broad way to let you know which are the epitopes that are impacted uh, by, by some mutations. Uh, however, we, are, we based our, uh, uh, what we did on public information. Uh, whereas uh, what we know about uh, vaccines that have been used so far is very, basically nothing. We don't know exactly the sequences, uh, the, uh, what, what protocol was used uh, to, to build these vaccines. So the answer to your question is, if you are an immunologist and uh, instead of by hand checking epitope by epitope, uh, which could be the, um, the impacts of new mutations, new variants, you can use our tools. But uh, um, it's, it's not possible that without uh, an immunology background, a strong immunology background, by using this tool, uh, you can come up with your own idea for a vaccine, of course. It is a way, a, a tool that uh, um, makes the work of immunologies faster, more uh, automatic, uh, let's say, automatized. Um, usually they have to uh, browse and by hand, one by one, the epitopes on databases, uh, on publications, they have to read papers that explain uh, information one by one. We gathered it uh, integrated in one system that allows you with a few clicks to understand and visualize the situation. Thank you, thank you. It was really an innocent question. <laughs> thank you. Uh, I think that we don't have any more questions. We want to thank you for this lovely uh, presentation. Oh, Vali, please. Uh, hello, Jeroshan. Vali, I was trying to, yes. to put some questions, but my internet was failing me. I don't know whether I can still join the conversation. Of course, yes, you we can. hear you. Yeah. Uh, first, Anna, uh, thank you so much for this uh, delightful uh, presentation. It was eye-opening uh, for me because I work in in a, in a computer science database and so on. So me, so seeing this this merge between two these these two big disciplines was fantastic. Thank you so for, so much for that. Uh, and when watching your presentation, I couldn't help but. Um, thinking about this, uh, this broad discussion around ethical considerations of having, uh, uh, let's say, data first approaches or algorithm for algorithmic first approaches. Um, do you anticipate any challenges in this regard when trying to uh, 
to push this approach into the mainstream? This is the, the first question. What Was it uh, clear enough? Yes, very interesting question, actually. <laughs> first you. question, yeah. Um, and a, fo a follow-up a follow question on that. Um, my understanding is that the, the quality of, of, uh, of the model uh, will, will, it will mirror the, the quality of the, the data that, uh, that was input, meaning that the model will be fed by, by a quality data. So um, it also is linked uh, with the, uh, let's say the coverage of, uh, uh, data input sites, uh, meaning that in a context similar to ours, for example, in Mozambique, you just you just showed that that we we couldn't find a, a meaningful data for Mo, for Mozambique. Mm -hmm. uh, I imagine that even in in Italy or in other countries, the the coverage of inputs uh, data input sites will not be evenly distributed. So. How do you account for these nuances um, in terms of, uh, of would, 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 would this uh, bring any sort of, of, of bias into the models that we are designing? If so, how, how, do, you, how do you tailor uh, your model? Or how you play around this, this question? Um, can I put uh, one final question? Ingenia yeah, Roshan, do we have time? I don't want to abuse. Uh, if Anna is comfortable, I am okay. Oh, of course, yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe I will ask you to, to recap the questions while I answer one or the other, but uh, please go for it. Very interesting question so far. Vali? Bali, probably we lost him. Internet issues. Yes. Yeah, the network today is very bad. Uh, but I think you can answer. Uh, we have the recording, no? Yeah, and also mm -hmm. it, it seems he's back. Uh -huh. Oh, I'm back. <laughs> yeah, okay. Internet again. So maybe. Was I? Was I? Yeah. 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 Maybe yes. Please. I yes, can, please. Yeah. I can start, start answering the first two because I they are already very uh, dense uh, in in content. Um, so the the first is uh, data driven or algorithm driven. Um, we've always been uh, um, traditionally a uh, um, a group that works in a data-driven way, and this is what I showed. Uh, in this case, uh, I think we were somehow uh, lucky uh, with this uh, approach because uh, as data are so many in this case, uh, indeed um, this richness in data was really provided a lot of interesting hypotheses, uh, a really interesting uh, test set, validation set uh, on which uh, observing uh, uh, new, uh, new phenomena, new mechanisms. So on, on one side, we perfectly know the uh, problems and the biases that are can be given by this approach, but on the other side, it was uh, very precious, uh, valuable in teaching us uh, new things that are happening. Uh, of course, when you don't have data, instead you have to be much more uh, expert in the domain to be able to, uh, to uh, formulate hypotheses. Um, you were asking if I, um, if I could anticipate challenges uh, in these two directions. And here I would like to connect to your second doubt, second question, point. Uh, this is very interesting, very central to this problem. And I don't know if you uh, happen to read some uh, commentary, some... Uh, papers, letters to editors that uh, are uh, written about this topic. 
it is a big problem, the bias in the sampling uh, of, of this data. Um, let's say that we tried to save ourselves from this bias because we give the responsibility of choosing the uh, interesting set of sequences to be analyzed to the user of the system. So it is a user of the system who first, I, I haven't shown some of the features of our systems, but uh, in many cases, you select uh, um, a specific geographical location and you see the distribution of sequences in that location. So of course, if you see that in that location, uh, sequences are collected in peaks, in very high peaks, and then for weeks, uh, there are no collected sequences, uh, things like that, that make the distribution very uneven, then, uh, uh, it is the responsibility is on you who shouldn't derive statistically uh, relevant or significant uh, um, conclusion. Uh, of course, uh, these systems uh, uh, perform and uh, are more useful in cases where you have a lot of data and heavenly distributed, such as United Kingdom and United States. Um, this we, we always knew. Um, we, we also asked ourselves uh, if it was uh, the case of, uh, uh, of producing systems just for those realities, uh, in, in which way we, we could have said our system is much more powerful, but we chose purposefully to make a general enough mechanism that could be fed in the future with any other kind of data. For example, Italy in the first year of pandemic was in the situation of Mozambique that we saw today. There was not enough data uh, to make any, any analysis. Now we start having something interesting. Of course, uh, for Africa, we have small coverages. We had the coverage for South Africa when there was a whole hype of the beta variant. Um, the beta variant, the Omicron variant, um, but also in that case we have the problem of bias because what happens is that once they find the variant that is supposedly more transmissible, more severe, then they will start sampling only people with that specific characteristics. So we, we will start thinking that everyone in South Africa and surrounding states is bringing only that variant. Uh, we had this problem where we were trying to develop a method, which I didn't show today because it was not very successful, to find if Omicron resulted from a recombination of other two lineages. Why was, that, was not that successful and why was not that successful with the data-driven approach? Because most probably you will not be able to find those two sequences or two sequences that were similar to the ones that recombined. Because most probably the poor person that uh, hosted those two different lineages within, inside here, him or herself, uh, was not sequenced, was not uh, sampled, uh, and therefore we will never know. So with a data-driven approach, if you have very specific questions, somehow you may not find um, an answer, or you may find an answer that is so vague that it doesn't uh, mean anything. So what you observe is very interesting. Uh, um, Actually, I forgot the, your comment about uh, the quality of the model uh, uh, mirrors the quality of the data. Indeed, our model was uh, thought, was de designed by learning from the data. So uh, the right solution is in between, of course. Uh, you shouldn't know everything from the data. Uh, but you also should not start models without knowing the limitations of the sampling system, sequencing system worldwide, what the machines do, what, what uh, they can do in terms of uh, coverage, uh, of quality, and so on and so forth. So I think our approach uh, went uh, more or less in the middle, probably more data-driven, uh, but... Uh, 
I don't have an answer, uh, to, to be honest. It, it's for sure an interesting direction on which we need to, to study more. Um, uh, that was quite rich. Thank you so much. Actually, I didn't just expect you to, but your, your take on it was, uh, was fantastic to, to, to hear. Thank you so much. Sure. Um, if you allow me, just one final question: What 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 do we have to to do to uh, to to be able to see some results in the future in that in the in that tool? How could we help? Um, when you selected I, I, Mozambique, there was not yeah. enough information. Okay. Yes. Oh, you're asking uh, what could you do as Mozambique in order to to have data there? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I see, I see. Okay. Yes, so, this uh, is ICT for <laughs> Dev project. So okay. give us a give us a clue. Okay. Um, so what I know from Italy, uh, which is not the most uh, organized reality in the world, unfortunately, is that each region has its own system, and each region uh, gives. Uh, so the um, Let's say the government of the region gives uh, uh, the, the power to different laboratories to uh, collect and sequence uh, some, uh, some viruses. Um, so the point is uh, maybe you could make a small research to understand if in Mozambique there exist laboratories mostly in uh, hospitals that have uh, the uh, machinery, so the sequencing machines uh, that are able to produce the sequences. They are quite uh, expensive, so I don't expect to be many, but maybe one or two uh, are, uh, are available and then uh, somehow move uh, the people around mm. the, the need for not only testing people for COVID with the quick test, uh, antigen test, but in some cases, uh, uh, mm, typically the ones that give a more severe disease, uh, ask to send that sample to someone who can sequence it. Once uh, the, the, the sequence is done, it's very easy. It's uh, a, a big uh, text file that can be uploaded within the Gizade system. So for this, of course, I can provide you the link and the, um, the protocol. But uh, the sequencing machine is something that should be bought at the higher levels. And, to be mm, honest, mm. I, I don't know who can do this uh, in your country or with which uh, collaborations, also international collaboration, this could be motivated. Probably it, it could be the case that uh, you, we write a call for action to some journal uh, or a nature blog to say uh, some countries cannot buy these uh, um, these machines, uh, let's understand how to, to create this network to, so that every region in the world has one. Something like this could be very interesting. Unfortunately, this goes uh, beyond the, my scientific uh, preparation, so I, I, I have no idea. Yeah. But it, it was, yeah, but it was, it was enlightening. Ingenier Roshan, maybe, maybe this could be an interesting follow-up to this uh, presentation with uh, the Minister of Health and uh, the National Institute of Health, because I'm sure that they have data entry points. And maybe this could be some a win for, for the ICT for, uh, for Deaf project. I agree, Vali, and uh, I'm happy Irish is here and she has something to say about it. Irish, please. Thank you, Roshan. Uh, um, thank you for your questions and thank you for giving me the space to speak. Uh, in fact, we have this, uh, all these information. What is lacking in Mozambique is to deposit this information in databases, in open databases. 
uh, we have all the information, the laboratories that are working with the COVID uh, virus, with SARS virus, uh, sorry, uh, are now uh, having more and more information. But this information is only in the, uh, in the books that are booklet, booklets that are in the laboratories. Most of this data does, does not get published and does not, uh, is not uh, in uh, databases that are open access. So we need, yes, of course, the help of uh, people like Bali that works with databases in a national uh, perspective. So they can help us to uh, take this information from the books that we have here, from the text files to uh, informat bioinformatic language, if I'm uh, saying it right. So yes, this could be an interesting point to start off. You can go to the uh, ENS test. They are the leading group working on this virus in Mozambique, and they have a strong group uh, with the molecular analysis, molecular biology analysis on this virus, and they are doing a great job there. But what is missing is someone from the IT that can help us to transform this data. Right. Well, this, uh, this starts to be very interesting also for us then, because we instead we are the data hunters. We are desperately in need of uh, someone uh, who has the data, but not the, let's say, the, um, uh, the artifacts or tools to, to elaborate it. So I, I actually, I just opened the Gizeh database and I found that uh, Mozambique, uh, from the uh, beginning of the pandemic, uh, um, uh, submitted 1,157 uh, sequences. Um, so it, it seems that uh, mostly uh, the um, sequences come from, uh, uh, maybe you know them. Uh, Biotechnology Center, I suppose, and also INSS. They are the yeah. leading group on this. Yeah, Instituto Nacional de Saúde, Saúde, sì. Yes. Maputo, sì. Mm -hmm. And also CERE, Center for uh, Epidemic Response and Innovation. They, re uh, they recall all the information from the NS and biotechnology. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So when you say that uh, uh, you have the data, you mean you already have faster sequences or uh, one step behind, maybe uh, yeah. the one fast few? We have the, we have the, 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 the results, we have, but we have to sequence them. Uh, some of them are already sequenced as far as I know. It's not always not my field, but I know from colleagues that are working with right. it. And uh, some of the sequences, uh, some of the data has already sent to be sequenced. And I don't know how many uh, up to now, but uh, what is missing is transforming this sequence in uh, bioinformatic data that can generate the outputs that you showed us today. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so in that case, the steps are not so big then. The, the... The missing steps are uh, uh, smaller than expected. So, in, in case, yeah, you want to get in touch, uh, I, I think now uh, Professor Baresi had to leave uh, because we uh, maybe we went a little bit farther than the usual time. Uh, but uh, Iris, if you are uh, interesting, maybe we we can uh, have a small uh, chat also with my. Um, PI, uh, my principal investigator, uh, in case there is space for some collaboration. Thank you, Anna. Uh, I think that it has become more interesting than it was initially, because uh, our colleagues uh, have uh, had good questions. And would you like to help us if we find a group of students in our summer school program who wants to develop something on this field? I'm not sure. Are you coming to Mozambique also? No. No, no, no. 
No, I okay. actually was contacted externally from Professor Baresi, but okay. uh, I, I'm not uh, in within this uh, program. Okay. Uh, maybe I can talk to him. However, uh, I will be quite busy in the next uh, semester. So I... Oh, oh the summer school is now. No, so I, unfortunately, I didn't... No, after after the summer school, the, the students will, uh, will have a project mm -hmm. and uh, they will start working on that project. So probably we can have someone from your team and uh, someone from here uh, working on it. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, Mozambican people, uh, they do some research, they work on it, but uh, we are a bit shy to to share the information, to, to share our results. So probably we can go uh, writing a, a, an article or something about that, uh, both Polymy and the UM. Okay, yeah. Uh, I'm in general, I'm very open available for these initiatives. Uh, I, I just have to warn you that uh, the next semester will be very full of uh, other commitments for me. Okay. So in case I, I have to uh, delay my, uh, my collaboration with you, maybe it's for the, the, uh, the semester later. I, okay. uh, I apologize okay. for this, but uh, keep me in the loop uh, for sure. Thank I you. Try. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was really interesting. Uh, thank you for your time, thank you for your presentation, and thank you everyone for this wonderful discussion. Thank you for, uh, for this invitation, it was a pleasure also for me. Uh, goodbye and see you for, uh, till the next time then. Next time, sure. Thank bye you. Bye. Bye.